six together. Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Good. Wow, that's hot. Turn that down a bit. There we go. Much better. Well, this is a beautiful day outside. The weather is, is just awesome, awesome. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, so we have uh, baptism going on across here by bubble. Um, so anyone who'd like to participate, just let us know, and, and we'll get you immersed in bowls. Just open the door, to the door to go in. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, if you're online with us this morning, we welcome you. Please say hi, so we know that you're with us here this morning, and uh, that uh, we can share this time with you this morning. Let's go to God in prayer as we open our service up this morning. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity today to gather together in your name and to worship you here today, freely and openly. And Lord, we thank you for all of the great blessings that you give us each and every week, all of the possibilities that we have in our life. Each day is a new start, a new beginning, and a new life in you. And we just praise you and thank you for that. We ask a special blessing as we go through our service today that you would be in the service in everything that we say and everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we continue this week, we are going through the series of the Bible mini-series, which was from the History Channel. And uh, so we are a little over halfway through, and it's, it's quite an eye-opener, especially uh, on Wednesday nights. We get to watch the videos and everything in there, and boy, they bring the Bible to life uh, in, in several different ways. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, so as we go through this experience, it kind of sets the path for us then uh, coming up this fall as we start The Chosen Season 4. We'll be doing that on Wednesday nights starting in September. And so we uh, are looking forward to that. So we've been through Season 1, Season 2, Season 3. They just wrapped up shooting on Season 5. And so that should be out post-production post work and everything. Usually somewhere around uh, next March it'll be out. So it takes just a little under a year to get all the editing and, and all those kind of things done and ready to take it to market. So we're looking forward to that here in September. Our next men's breakfast then is the next thing up here. Uh, will be September 7th at 9 a.m. in the morning. So we're going to have uh, breakfast in here. And usually we have one surprise thing besides our normal biscuits and gravy. We, can, we can't let you out on that one, Denny. Um, so this time we're going to be doing breakfast burritos, so should be fun. Uh, great time is had for all when we come in here. We got a lot of talking about things like cars and all kinds of other things. We do have a nice devotional uh, that we share with one another. It's always a really good time, and so we look forward to having that. And then the next week we have... No, oh. oh. Same Wait a minute, same day, yeah. Same day. Wow, yeah, I about jumped into the wrong month. So, same day, later on that day, then we convert this in from a meal eating place in here. We'll put up our big screen and our sound in here, and we'll be showing the movie Evan Almighty in here. And that movie is, it's kind of a comedy, it's fun, it's its a little different look. It doesn't, uh, we'll, we say this out loud, it doesn't follow the scriptures, so... You know, what it does is it opens up an opportunity for us to talk about the scriptures and what, what we're seeing in the movie as well. But that is going to be a fun time. Hopefully everybody will be here. Doors open at 5.30, movie at 6 o'clock. And as always, we have more than just a temptation tray over there. We've got popcorn, so we've got our popcorn maker here. And we have hot dog steamers here. And we have... Uh, brownie bites usually and, and those types of things. So it's, it's always a really, really good time. We look forward to that. And then September 10th, we have Orange Track Racing. So we go from being a movie 14th. theater one week. 14th. 14th? Yep, 14th. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Who wrote this? I guess I did. Uh, so we convert this into our racetrack in here and uh, so we're going to have a good time racing in here, and that's always fun. That's Saturday morning, and uh, registration at 9, racing starts at 10, and more information on orangetrack.org. And so today, as we go through, and for you people online, we will have our 
uh, messages and the videos and everything that we show along with this for the music videos posted up online here. Pastor Terry will be putting that up here very shortly. So that's our announcements for today. We're going to go ahead and go into our call to worship. So let's enter into this time of worship. Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you. And we ask for you to open up our ears to hear your message today and our hearts to receive that message and for us to be able to live that message out each and every day. Lord, we ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he brings forth the message today. And we just ask that he would be anointed in your presence and in your spirit today to give the message that you've laid upon his heart to give to us today. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. So our call to worship today comes from John 5, uh, verses 28 through 29. And it says, Don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all of the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to an experience of eternal life, and those who have continued to do evil will rise to experience judgment. So in John, this is kind of a first look that we had where Jesus is telling them that, hey, here's what the future is going to be and here's what the future is going to look like. So the Apostle John here speaks to us about last days. But moreover, he speaks to us of promises in this message. So we have a promise of resurrection, the promise of salvation, than if you are good in spirit. And that's what he means by doing good. Doesn't mean that you're a good person, you're just gonna go out there and wash everybody's car in the parking lot today. That doesn't get you into heaven. That, don't, that doesn't bring you into eternal life. But being good in the spirit, having a good godly presence in your life is what he's talking about here. And that brings on the promise of salvation. But those who have unbelief, who, who will not accept the message of Christ, then they have the consequences of rejecting the Word of God, rejecting the Holy Spirit upon them. And it's kind of that glimpse as he was telling them in the future, you've got two choices to make, as we all do. And, you know, it's that fork in the road. You can take the good road or you can take the bad road. The choice is yours. That's that free will that God offers us. So hearing the voice of the Son of God then brings you to spiritual life because you were spiritually dead before you knew who Christ was. And so that's the resurrection part of it, that promise of resurrection. The hour for this possibility arrived in Jesus' first coming. So see, that's a possibility. And, and again, it goes back to that free will choice that we can make. So it's a possibility that we have to take one road or to take the other. It's our choice. Choose wisely. So when we talk about Jesus' first coming and, and we see that his ministry started as he was baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist, and that was truly the beginning. That's when the clock started running on his, on his ministry here on earth. So that was a call for all of those who were lost and dead in sins that there was a future for them then if they believed. Now this was a completely different message than they were getting from the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time. And so this was a departure. And, and I talked about revolution last week in my message. That Jesus, from his birth and into his ministry, caused a revolution amongst the Jewish people and the Gentiles at the same time. So it, it points to a dire future for those who remain dead in their sins, those who have unbelief, as it says. A future time is coming when those who are physically dead will be brought back again, brought to light, a bodily resurrection to live. And a, you have your choice. You can either live as someone in the spirit, or you can live as someone who's going to be condemned. So this is one of the clearest teachings concerning what the future uh, is going to be like for anyone who uh, is alive on the earth. So it wasn't just for the Jewish people. This message was for all. And it's a preeminent type of passage for the discussion of those two resurrections. And so we, we talk about a premillennial period, the thousand year reign when Jesus returns. And this is what he's talking about here. When I come back again, then you will be judged upon either your sinful nature 
or your spiritual nature, one of the two. So it's a point to a special privilege for believers who sacrifice their lives for Christ and then participate in that millennial reign, that thousand year reign that talks about in, uh, in Revelation. So it's a symbolic assurance that Christ's victory is greater and that belief trumps then the worldly powers that was seeking to kill off the believers in that day and time. And we talk a lot about cultural reference uh, in the Bible and, and who it's speaking to and when it's speaking to them and why it's speaking to them. And so this is a revelation to those people at that time. Uh, it may point to the first resurrection of believers before the millennium and a second resurrection afterwards for unbelievers, once condemned to the pit of fire, thus giving us a clear choice for our future. This was the first glimpse into Jesus' ministry when he announced this in John. So, Lord, we just uh, thank you for this message. We thank you for the call to worship that uh, Pastor Terry put forth for us here this morning for the ability to understand your word more thoroughly and to apply it to our lives ourselves. So we ask right now that you would just bless Pastor Terry as he comes forward to give us the message that's on his heart today. In Jesus' name. Good morning. Good morning. Such morning. a beautiful day outside. So, thinking about the episode that's coming up of the Bible this week and uh, the different stories that were in it, one stuck out, and that was the story of Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. And as I was thinking about that, I think about there are times in our lives when we all feel buried. Uh, whether it's in our work, our relationships, our finances, it might be mentally, physically, even spiritually. Um, this past week, uh, I know a lot of folks were uh, mentally buried when they heard about the fire that destroyed the, uh, an institution here in Cedar Rapids, the Lighthouse Inn. In fact, uh, when I saw the owner's name, I had to wonder if he was... Uh, related to someone else I knew. And it turns out that it was um, my former admin at the uh, previous ministries, ex-brother-in-law uh, ex is the owner. And so there's a lot of heartache that I'm sure that he is going through, a lot of heartache that the people that he employed are going through, and certainly all the customers that love going there. There's just so much that can cause us heartache. It may be a loss in your family. It may be uh, all kinds of different things. But today we're going to be reading about and talking about a loss in a different family, that of the family of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and turn to John chapter 11. If you don't, there's some over there. Uh, you can grab those up or you can raise your hand and Mark will bring you one. See, I volunteered him. Voluntold, I guess that would be. He's used to that. He's used to that. Well, you do a good job of that, right? You've trained him on how to be volunteered. Yeah, absolutely. I'm well trained. So. Hard to try. Uh, so let's go to starting in verse 1. And we're going to go through this in sections. So it'll be verse 1 through 16. So a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus replied, there are 12 days of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. 
But at night there's danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and die with Jesus. So in this passage this morning, Lazarus has been sick and he's died. Mary and Martha believed Jesus was able to help because they had witnessed miracles. Much in the same way they reached out to Jesus, we too can do so in prayer. Yet Jesus waited. Why would he wait if he knew how sick Lazarus was? He knew their pain, but yet he still waited. It's difficult for us to to understand God's timing. Mary and Martha and the disciples, yeah, they certainly didn't understand his timing. Yes, prayers are answered. And sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes it's no. And oftentimes it's just quite simply not yet. We don't always know what's best for us. We think we do. God knows what's best for us. We also have to remember that God's timing is not our timing. If you remember from last week's message, Mark talked about a thousand years is up but one day, and one day is but a thousand years. So God's time is not ours. He exists outside of what we know is time. But in God's timing, he's giving us an opportunity for our faith to grow. In the movie we're going to see in a couple of weeks, there's a scene where uh, Evan's wife talk, is talking to the waiter, who just happens to be Morgan Freeman, who's playing God. And she said, why doesn't God give me patience? And he says, do you ever think God is giving you an opportunity to be patient? There's so much more that's happening when he's having us wait. We learn patience for sure, but our faith can grow through it. And just as in today's passage, we then can see his glory, not ours, as he brings us through whatever trial we are dealing with. When Jesus finally tells them it's time to go, the disciples object. In fact, they, they probably were arguing with him about it. Sounds familiar. They were concerned, of course, about his safety. What they don't realize is the lengths that Jesus is willing to go and ultimately will go or would go just for us. In fact, he would ultimately go to those same lengths if it was just one of you. I keep getting drawn back to this book in the Bible, have been for the last three or four weeks, but in Ecclesiastes 3.1, Solomon writes, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. And then in verse 11, Solomon writes, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in, our, in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. We cannot see the whole scope of his work, and I don't know about you, but that's frustrating. God, what's next? I don't know. I'm getting frustrated by it. I've got a, co a former co-worker, her name's Carolyn, uh, talked about her before, she is going through a cancer journey, a very serious cancer journey. And she just had a recent setback in her treatment. Her surgery has been postponed and it's due to some findings in her blood work that is having her 
redo other things. And she is, to say the least, devastated by this news. And she believed that she was so close to the end of the tunnel. And she now is crying out to God, wanting to know the plan that he has for her. Yet God never said it would be easy. Aditha Abram said this, we wait, or excuse me, we pray, we wait, we hope, we believe, and in God's perfect time, we see his faithful plan unfold. In verses 9 and 10 of the passage we just read, Jesus talks about the light of day and the darkness of night. Now, in the first glance of reading that passage, you think, okay, yeah, daytime, it's light out, nighttime, it's dark. But have you ever considered that these two verses that he's talking about are actually talking about daylight being the knowledge of God's will? And that stumbling about in the night is when we are relying on ourselves. Didn't God lead the Israelites in the desert, the pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night? The disciples still don't understand it, and they're thinking that Lazarus is just sleeping, that gets a little bit rest, he's going to be good. You know, you get a cold, you go to bed, you sleep it off. I know I've been very sick, and I'll sleep for 14, 16 hours, which is like 11, 12 hours more than I normally would. And I wake up and I'm refreshed. That's what they're thinking at this point. But it is then that Jesus has to get straight to the point with them. And he just plainly tells them, Lazarus is dead. Now, even though they feared following him, they did. They went to Bethany with him. And as a side note, notice what Thomas said. Let's go to and die with Jesus. The importance of this did not escape John when he was writing this, because it goes back to show when we think about what happens later after Jesus' resurrection, Thomas says, I won't believe it until I see the holes in his hand and in his side. Yet here, he says, let's go to and die with Jesus. goes to show that no matter how confident we are spiritually, tomorrow can bring uncertainty. Mary and Martha were confident in Jesus' ability to heal their brother. They had no idea what the next few days would bring. Now when Jesus and the disciples arrived, Mary and Martha were heartbroken at the loss of their brother. Now, soon that would change for them, but the heartache at that point, at that moment, was real, and it was difficult. Rhetorical question for you all. Can you remember a time when you went from heartache to joy? Several years ago, what? Okay, mid-2000s. <laughs> first decade of the new century, um, we, uh, I was, I married into a family with a dog. This dog didn't like me much, but after a while we grew to like each other. And it came a point in time, about just a few years before she passed, where she wasn't able to walk on all four legs. She, she'd walk with her front two legs and drag her back. We took her to the vet and the vet said take her home, spend the weekend with her. They were to bring her back on Monday. We took her home and I, Diane must have been at work. I was off or had gotten off work and I was laying in the, or sitting on the floor in the living room holding Kelly and just cried out to God. This dog had gotten under my skin. This dog that I didn't care for was now something that uh, it was part of the family. And uh, Sunday night, all of a sudden, this 
disabled dog started sprinting around the house again. We got another two or three years with her. Heartache to joy. So let's see how this story continues to play out by picking up John 11 at verse 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. And when the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus's grave to weep. So they followed her there. And when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, when I was reading and rereading that verse, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. I actually heard something that could have been easily said by her. In her frustration, Martha said, and imagine the verse saying this instead. In her frustration, Martha said to Jesus, this is all your fault. You knew Lazarus was sick, but you didn't think it was important enough or worth your time to get here sooner. And I can hear the attitude in her voice as she says it. And I can hear it out of our my own self. In frustration, forgetting who God is, putting him in this little box. But what she said next, she could not have said if she still had, if she didn't have faith. She knew God would do whatever Jesus asked. Reminds me of the demon possessed boy that we read about in Mark 20, when the father says, I do believe but help me overcome my disbelief. It's almost like it's, it's reversed for Martha. She's giving her unbelief first and then her belief. And I think we can all agree that even though we believe, even though we have faith, doubt easily creeps in. It is then that we have to take those doubts straight to God. We need to whether it's getting on your knees physically or just for getting down and praying, we need to pray and believe that he will help us through whatever it is we're struggling and with. And remember again, that answer may be yes, no, or not yet. Throughout the Gospels, we learn that Jesus does have the power over life and death and that he does forgive our sins. Now let me be clear, what Lazarus was going through, the fact that he died was not due to any sin. It was to bring glory to God through Jesus. It did, as we read, show Martha was more than just someone who couldn't sit, sit still long enough to talk to Jesus. Go back to, go to Luke 10 again. She's busy getting things ready and complaining about her sister sitting at Jesus' feet. She's a busybody. She couldn't sit still. I don't know anybody like, oh wait, that's me. But it also, in this passage, shows her great faith. 
she did so. She showed this great faith, even though her world had just been rocked at the loss of her brother. This stands in stark contrast against anyone who doesn't have faith. Her faith was such that she was still able to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, whereas someone who has no faith, oddly enough, blames God. I'll leave that one right there. Now, Martha would go back in our, the passage we just read, and she would go back to tell Mary that Jesus wanted to see her. And then we get to verse 33. And it says, When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up with him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, See how much he loved him. But some said, The man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Those were your skeptics. They're not believers. And the last and only thing that Mary said to Jesus was, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then I have to imagine, because it says doesn't say she says anything else, I have to imagine she fell to her knees at Jesus' feet and wept. Those who were with her also wept. It was either from a loss of a friend or out of sympathy for Mary and Martha. I don't know about you. I'm a sympathy crier. Somebody else is crying about something. I can get involved in that emotion. So some of it may have been that. But regardless, this troubled and deeply moved Jesus in spirit. Then Jesus wept. Even though he knew that he was going to bring Lazarus back to life, he wept. Jesus showed not only how much he cared for Lazarus, but also for each and every one of us. Here he wept at the loss of his friend. He also weeps for us. He weeps at our decisions. He weeps at our actions. He weeps at anything that does not bring glory to God. In Hebrews 4.15, it's, the writer says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So Jesus is like us, but not like us. He is able to empathize with all our weaknesses, but he never sinned. Jesus was sinless, and because of that, he is able to help us. This stands in a, a stark contrast to gods of other religions who show no emotion other than anger, and they certainly aren't involved with any of us messy humans. Why would the God want to be involved with us and all of our junk and the mess of our lives? We see how much our God cares. We see it through Jesus' emotions, through his compassion, his sorrow and his frustration. Some saw Jesus' response when he wept and understood how great his love is. The others mocked him, wondering why he couldn't keep Lazarus from dying. That latter group, well, yeah, they were about to get a little bit of a shock. Let's pick it back up at verse 38. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out aloud. For the sake of all of these people standing here, so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in his head cloth. Jesus told them, Unwrap him and let him go. Jesus 
Jesus gets the tomb and there's a cave with a stone covering the entrance. All of a sudden I'm flooded with other images of caves and stones in front of entrances. We just watched an episode of the Bible here recently where we saw Daniel. Now in the episode we saw, he was put into a cave with a metal door. But in the scriptures we read that there was a stone that was rolled across the front of that door and then it was sealed. And when I say it was sealed, they took hot wax and they poured it on that seal. Then uh, Darius the Mede, the king, he came and put his royal seal on it. And then all of his nobles who were with him put their seals on it as well. It was sealed. They would know if it was broken and it had been opened up. Daniel comes out because of his great faith. And this was much to the delight of Darius. He didn't want to put him in there. But he came out because of his great faith. Later in the Gospels, we get to the cave in which Jesus is buried, and the stone in front of it is also sealed. Same way. Now, Jesus didn't need anybody to roll that stone away. He was resurrected by God. Of course, we had what felt like an earthquake. The stone moves, and he's not there. Now, the other thing, and, and I was thinking about this this morning. When Lazarus came out, he's still wrapped. And Jesus has to say, unwrap him and let him go. When Mary goes into the tomb where Jesus was? What do we see? The grave clothes are just laying there in a pile, then the head cloth is that kind of a napkin of sorts is folded up nice and neatly. But as Jesus says, roll that stone aside, and Mary's doubt kicks in again. She didn't, she wasn't thinking that Lazarus was going to walk out of there. All she thought of was what? That, and I can't even imagine what that was. The, the awful smell of his corpse. But think about it. There's some symbolism there. The smell of his corpse. How about the stench of our sin? Our sin sinks and Jesus still is there to bring us out of it, to wash us clean. But then Marcia, she doubt to faith again. She shows her faith by saying, basically saying, okay, yeah, go ahead. Roll the stone away because it, she allows it to happen. Instead of seeing as believing, Martha out of faith went with believe. And then see. Before doing anything else, Jesus gives thanks to the Father and prayed. Something that he continues to do for us today and into eternity. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on our behalf. Meaning he is continuing to intercede in prayer on behalf of us as he sits at the right hand of the Father and he will continue to do so today, tomorrow, and into eternity. Jesus can and will help us through everything we go through in life, through every trial, through every circumstance. And right now he's sitting right there doing that. After praying, Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. He calls Lazarus by name. Over and over, I kept reading those three words, wondering why he called Lazarus out by name. But then I remembered these tombs weren't just for an individual person. There were other people that were also buried in there. Remember, Jesus' tomb is a brand new one, so he was the only one in there. But Lazarus was in there with others. So he calls him out by name. 
What if Jesus had simply shouted, come out? Would all those other people that were in that tomb with Lazarus have also come out? That is when I went back to, or back one chapter, John 10, looked at verses 27 and 28, where it says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. So Lazarus knew Jesus' voice. So when he called him out, he came. When Jesus calls us by name, God calls us by name. Lazarus heard Jesus' voice and he obeyed. When he calls your name, do you obey? Jesus has the power to take what is dead and hopeless in your life and bring it back to life. And you've heard it many, many times here at Grace Street Church. Believe and receive. Do not let your circumstances paralyze you or worse yet, cause you to die spiritually. Each of us has areas in our lives that are hopeless, lifeless, desperate, desperate to be filled by something, anything. What are you filling it with? God has broken the chains of sin and death, but it is still possible that we feel them. And I thought about that, and I thought about that, and then I remembered having to carry pagers years ago. Usually had always had one. Sometimes if I was on call, I had to have two. And even when they weren't there, you may have experienced this yourself, you felt that vibration. That you looked out, oh, nothing there. It would later happen when I would have a cell phone. Um, I don't carry my cell phone on there. It's in my back pocket because they change shape. And even when it's not in my back pocket, every once in a while you feel that. They were just phantom feelings. Much like what Satan does by rattling the chains of sin and death, trying to trap you and getting you into remembering what you did and who you were and trying to keep you there. But we can, with God's help, overcome the accuser's plans to destroy us. Too many people find it difficult to step out and trust God. They're comfortable with what they know. Pretty much like sitting in the jail cell, doors wide open, but you're sitting in there because it's comfortable. You know it. It's The surroundings are familiar. What's out there is scary. Psalm 91 tells us that God is our shelter and our refuge and our fortress when we are afraid. And no matter how intense your fears, your worry, your heartache, trade it all for trust in God. Stop looking back like Lot's wife did. Remember what happened to her? With God, the past is the past. Your sins are forgiven. Stop picking him up and trying to carry him yourself. Jesus never said that being his follower would be easy. Mary and Martha and certainly Lazarus went through their trials as we do. They're necessary. But remember not to give them more importance than what you have already learned from them. Take what you learned, move on. Don't lose your future, your eternity, because you can't and won't let go. God commands obedience. He wants us to let go. Think Abraham, think Noah, Moses, just to name a few. When we are called by God, he isn't saying, okay, go ahead, delegate that to someone else, and you stay right where you're at. He's calling you personally to go and do there are eternal implications, eternal consequences when we don't listen to his call. Our fears and insecurities can get in the way. There's a Bible study up there that I look at every Sunday by Philip Yancey. It says, if you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. If you want to live a life of joy and fulfillment, Fulfillment. If you want to live a life of joy and fulfillment, you have to get out of the cave. You can't stay there. And this is going to age me, and I know. But an old foreigner song says, In my life there's been heartache and pain. I don't know if I can face it again. Yeah. 
you can. Our lives are full of heartache and pain. But by placing our trust in Jesus, we can know a joy that fills all the emptiness this earthly life throws at us. As the song Trading My Sorrow says, I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promises will endure, that his joy is going to be my strength. Though my sorrows may last for the night, his joy comes with the, with the morning. Father God, we just thank you that no matter what we're going through, any circumstance that we are dealing with, that you are walking that path with us. You are journeying with us. You are helping to bring us from heartache to joy. We just have to reach out to you, Father. Let us remember that you are our guide. Let us remember to be in your word daily. Remind us to come together often for worship, for study, for fellowship, for fun, but to come together as with other Christians. Because as Solomon wrote in the Proverbs, iron sharpens iron. And together we sharpen ourselves. We help each other grow. We help each other through each of those circumstances. And we do go from heartache to joy. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we prepare for this time of communion this morning, uh, I ask you to think back on the message here and, and what we're being called out of. And If you don't have a communion cup, raise your hand or just tell Pastor Terry he'll bring them. We have some on the back table back there. But as we come into this time of communion today, it's a, it's a time for us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us for that salvation to bring us out of that sin to bring us out of the darkness and into the light because he is the light of the world and so in that passage that pastor terry was going through in john today it talked about coming in that you don't have to worry about being in the darkness if you're in the light of the world if you have the light of the world and jesus said i am the light of the world and so he says if you were in me don't fear the darkness there's nothing to fear. As we were dead in our sins, we were surrounded by darkness, by death. And so with his death on the cross, he separated us from death, from eternal damnation, as we talked about in the call to worship this morning. He is the light of the world, and as we bring Christ into our lives, we're called then at communion to join with him in that salvation act in the breaking of the bread and in the drinking of the cup. Because that brings us in communion with the light of the world, with Jesus himself. So on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup and after he had filled it and blessed it, he said, this cup is the cup of a new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And as often as we are to do so until Jesus comes again, as we are gathered together each time, we are to take of that bread, partake of his body, and partake of his cup, his salvation for us as a reminder that we are saved through Christ, through his sacrifice. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. Well, as we come into our time of prayers with people today, um, our prayer warrior is on the road. They, they, uh, Steve and Denise went to visit uh, Jen, who had fallen again last week. And so they wanted to go and, and visit with her and make sure that she was doing all right. Um, so Denise is our prayer word for those of you who do not know. Um, but she, she just does an awesome job. And so 
as we come into this time of prayer today we have prayer sheets on the back table there that we pray over every Wednesday night and if we have some new prayers that we haven't had since last Wednesday if you would like to lift them up right now I'll do my best to fill in for Denise I won't do as good a job as she does but uh, does anybody have any other prayers that you'd like lifted up okay well we do have prayers this morning for uh, a couple who had some family members who have passed away uh, this past week in here, and so we'll be lifting them up as well. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, you know uh, all of the petitions that are out there for people who are sick, who need your healing, for those who are struggling both spiritually, mentally, physically, financially. Lord, we lift them up with you again. For those who have had the loss of a family member recently, we lift them up to you today. This week, since Wednesday, we've had the, the family of Evelyn Driscoll who passed away on Thursday, so we lift their family up today. Uh, we lift up Deb and Joe Connor's family in the passing of their granddaughter's husband who was electrocuted on a tower this last week. So we lift them up. It's, it's, I've been talking with Deb and, and it's really hit their family hard. We lift them up to you today, Lord. We lift their hearts up to you. We lift up the family that's with us here today and the loss of their loved one as well. And for those who are in hospice care, uh, I just got word last night that another friend um, is being put into hospice uh, as, as of yesterday. And so we lift that family up too. We lift them up in their grief. We pray a prayer for care and comfort to surround them, for your love to encompass them, to pierce their hearts, and so that they can live with you within them. Lord, we ask for that light to bring them out of this dark time in their lives, this time of grieving and passing. Lord, it's great to celebrate their lives and all of the things that they did while they were with us, and it's even better for us to celebrate the fact that they are coming home. Lord, we just uh, pray today that as we look at the world around us, we pray for a very lost world. We pray that we are in a very dark place, but you are the light of the world, and you can bring us through the darkness just through our faith in you and belief. And Lord, we just lift all these things up today. We claim them as victories in your name. And Father God, we say, yeah, all God's people said, As we prepare to end this portion of our service, for those of you online, thank you for joining us. And I send you out with this priestly blessing that the Lord gave to Moses. Tell Aaron, he said, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites, and this is how we bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.